welcome to tonight's service as we gather at the cross and the drama that takes us to Jesus' death. We come here not because we always wanted to. It would be a lot easier to just go straight from Monday, Thursday to Easter. It might even be easier to go all straight from Palm Sunday to Easter. But we come here because we can't skip the betrayal and the death and the fear and the requirement and the request that we let go of all that we carry with us. So we show up tonight because we know that the freedom that comes from Jesus comes with the gift of submission. We show up tonight because we know that the gift comes with letting go and going with Jesus all the way to the cross. We show up tonight because we know that we too want and need the gift of surrender. And I know those are big words, and like a lot of us, they ask a lot of us, just like Jesus does. And I know that the words submission and surrender are tough, and sometimes even bring up feelings that we, and memories that we don't really want to, want to deal with. Moments of people taking advantage of us or feeling trapped. They're wrapped in the emotions of defeat and failure and powerlessness. But that's not why Jesus uses them on this day. For Jesus, submission and surrender are about fully trusting God with everything, including the very hardest thing, which is our very selves, and Jesus' very self. It asks us to let go of all the things that we hold on to, the control we wish we had over situations, our health, our relationships, our work. We try and hold on to the ways we expect the world to be. We hold on to the ideals and the visions that we have for the future. And we're asked to lay down all of our plans, all of our fears, all of our worries, all of our judgments about ourselves and others and the world, and to submit all of it right here at this table. So tonight we reframe those hard words with another spiritual discipline, the practice that Jesus does with us. One of fully trusting God with his plan for our salvation and trusting God with his plan for our lives today. So we hope that in doing so, we discover the gift of freedom that happens at the cross. Because Jesus, life, death, and resurrection are really all about you. So tonight, we are going to, you're invited to, uh, you're going to be invited to come forward to light one or a couple of these candles as a sign of your surrender or submission to Jesus. The moment that we're all giving of ourselves and all that we have letting it go right here at this table. As we sing in a few minutes, you'll be invited to come up, light a candle, and then return to your seats when you are ready. During the service, we'll hear the story of Jesus' last moments read by our liturgists. After each reading, there will be some musical meditation played for us to reflect and think about all the things that we need to surrender or submit to Jesus. I invite you to let the story of Jesus' death wash over you and let it be a story of your own as we submit and surrender all that we have to the one who came and lived and died with you. Let us pray. Oh God of mystery and wonder, we are here because we know the end of the story. And it's tempting for us to ignore the ways that you submitted and surrendered for us. It's tempting to go about our business as usual. It's tempting for us to move too quickly to the dawn of light on Easter morning. But we ask that you give us courage and strength for today to spend just a little while in the darkness, to set aside our comfort and pleasure, and to feel this moment to feel your submission and surrender for us and with us. 
Help us find the freedom to lean into you, fully trusting that with you, we will find life. Guide us through song and prayer and meditation so that we might see you moving through this night with us. In your name we pray. Amen.
When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed Kidron Valley. On the other side there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said, and Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers, with its commanders and the Jewish officials, arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. We all want power, don't we? We all want the power to say yes or to say no. The power to defend, to reject, to jump in with both feet or say no way. But when we surrender to Jesus, our own power is not taken away. Instead, we can see ourselves and others as Jesus sees us, as equals, as valued, as loved as the very person that God created you to be. Oh Lord, help us to surrender to our power. Amen. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of the man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold. 
and the servants and the officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it again, saying, I'm not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, a rooster began to crow. How many times do we disown God? I don't often think of it like this, but we do do that sometimes. We've chosen what we want over what God wants for us. When we think we have control and we don't really want to follow what God expects of us. Or when we're tempted to let fear and worry take over. When we let the world tell us what is right instead of what God thinks is right. Oh God, help us surrender to our temptations. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, uncleanl they did not enter the palace, because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. <clears throat> your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not on this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. What is truth? 
retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. How many times have we judged like the Pharisees did that day? How many times have we tried to pass judgment off like someone else, on someone else like Pilate did? How many times do we judge each other based on what we have done or not done, how others voted, what car they drive, what experiences they have or ones we have? Jesus died for all those people that we've judged. And he only judges with grace. Oh God, help us surrender our judgments. Amen. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in purple robe and went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God.
When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. We are the ones who hold on to our own guilt and shame and sins. It's not Jesus. Jesus is the one who frees us from all of it. But he's also the one who knows all about it. It's his life on earth that taught us how Jesus and God deal with our mistakes and sins and gives them fully to the grace given in God. So much so, that he took on this public action to teach us and remind us what it means to truly surrender all that sin and shame and guilt that we carry along. We do it so that we can free ourselves to be the value people that God gives us to be, the ones who he loves just the way we are. So God, help us surrender to our guilt. Amen.
So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. The garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciples, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Everybody has a few expectations of Jesus. The disciples expected Jesus to be the kind of king they wanted on Palm Sunday. The Pharisees expected Jesus to take control. Pilate expected Jesus to do something different. What expectations do you put on Jesus? What expectations do you put on yourself? What expectations do you put on each other? The only expectation that Jesus has put on you is to let all of those expectations go. All so that we can put on the easy yoke that Jesus gives to us. The one that's not hard or stressful. The one with no expectations except to share the load. O oh Lord, help us to surrender to our expectations. Amen.
Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you, may all, you also may believe. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. More than anything, we try and control the deaths in our life. What dies and what lives. But this is only counterfeit control. When we surrender to our own death, it's when we truly begin to really live with the freedom that comes with valuing others, ourselves, and trusting in the God who died with you and for you so that we could all live in Christ together. Lord, help us to surrender to our death. Amen.
the hardest parts of surrender or submission is that it is the very opposite of what the world tells us we need. The world tells us that submission or, su or surrender looks a lot like this. Darkness. It's wrong. It's giving up control and giving power over to somebody else. And nobody wants that. And when I even ask people what they thought of when they heard the word submission, they said that it was giving up control, that it was letting go, that it was admitting fault. And when I asked about surrender, for many it meant defeat and failure. But this is not what submission or surrender looks like for Jesus. For Jesus, when we submit to the one who loves us unconditionally, when we surrender to not what we want, but what God wants, The light shines once again in the darkness. You see, surrender is the only way to truly live the way God calls us to live. Surrender. And submission is the way we find truth and trust in a world that is so full of distrust and disunity and darkness. No matter what, you, what your history looks like with these particular words, whether you like them or you don't like them, tonight I invite you to find a new way of hearing them. Because it's never been about what the world says, that when you submit or surrender, you're giving up the fight or you're letting go, or are you saying someone else has control over you? What you're saying is you trust in something that is much bigger than anything that we could ever imagine. Someone that is so big that he's willing to die on the cross for you. Someone who says he's willing to go to the darkest and hardest place that you've ever been or ever will go. Someone who says you're never in it alone. This is what submission looks like. It looks like your light once again turning back on. This, my friends, is the clear path to Easter. Not one in darkness, but one that is guided by one tiny light of glimmer, one hope, one truth. So I invite you, as we gather in silence, to surrender. To surrender to all the expectations and let it all go. To submit to the one who came for you. 
so that the light is finally clear and the path is right before you. It's not a path where you can see miles ahead. Sometimes it's only inches. Sometimes it's only moments. But this light, this kind of submission gives us the freedom to transition from the cross death to a cross life. And I invite you, friends, to make that transition now. Let us spend a few moments in silence.
we give it all to you. We've watched the world's light fade and we remember the darkness of the night in this moment of submission, the darkness of surrender. But it's not a surrender to the darkness. It's a surrender to the freedom that comes with your life and light that leaves, lives and leads us. So as we sit in the darkness, help us to surrender all those judgments and fears and worries and overwhelming moments and the pain and the loss as we trust in you. Remind us to dispel the evils of this world with your good. And we lay it all down before you. All the things that we've held on to, all the things that we thought we could do better, all the things that we thought you didn't get, all of it. All the things that we're afraid to name out loud, we put them all here at the foot of the cross, knowing that the darkness does not win. And we leave here tonight, not abandoned or lost or lonely or worried, but with hope and the freedom that comes by surrendering to you. Give us the freedom that comes in submission of knowing your way is the way. In this moment, shine your light in the places that need humility and grace and truth and humanity and compassion and equality and justice and your way. And in those places of darkness, Help us to submit and surrender them too. Show us how to walk in the darkness. Teach us when we forget and guide us back with the prayer you taught your disciples to say, praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we leave this place in darkness. But the light of Christ goes with us as we surrender to that darkness. Let us go in Christ's peace. Amen.